Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Forbes and I'm a forest ecologist. In this video, we're going to be looking at forest regeneration and forest succession. This is the third video in a series of looking at what is forest ecology. So come with me and let's look at forest regeneration and forest succession. This episode is focused on an area of the Tukituki River in central Hawke's Bay, Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's an area that I conducted a forest restoration experiment in nine years ago. I'll post a link to the publication from the experiment in the description below. In this video I will revisit one of the treatment plots from the experiment and look at the effect of canopy opening on forest regeneration and succession. I will also look at the site from the perspective of enabling natural regeneration to scale up restoration, even in weedy environments like this area of the Tukituki riverbed. Because of the weedy nature of the riverbed, and the favourable attributes of the site for native forest regeneration, this site makes for a great case study of forest regeneration and succession, and how weedy vegetation can affect these processes, both positively and negatively. By forest regeneration, I refer to the natural establishment and recruitment of forest flora. Forest regeneration is a critical component of a forest ecology as it provides a basis for canopy recruitment and therefore it is what helps make a forest permanent. It requires a suitable climate, dispersal of forest seed, such as performed by this kiriru, and freedom from barriers of excessive competition and herbivory. At this site, a major barrier to forest regeneration is the dense covering of the riverbed by exotic weeds. Most of these weeds will prevent forest regeneration in the foreseeable future, although there is one species here, bitter willow, which has a positive effect on native tree species by reducing competition for other weed species and providing conditions suitable for native tree recruitment. So when we talk about forest succession, what we're referring to is a change over time in species. And typically we'll find a progression over time um, towards dominance of species that take up the canopy and mature forests. So at this site we'll see things like titoki, um, matai, meadow, um, species that will live a very long time and require some particular conditions really to enter the forest succession. So at the site like this where we see grassland, go to willow, go to totra, matai, meadow, um, pigeonwood, titoki, these are species, this is sort of a, a good indication that we've got a successional development going on. So this tree is a willow, it's a common name bitter willow or hoary willow, it's Salix aleognis is the scientific name and it's become naturalised which means it's, it has the ability in this environment to spread on its own. It makes up quite a bit of cover on the riverbed. So now I'm on the edge of the willow cover just coming into the stand and look if we look out on the edge you know it's a real mess out there there's all sorts of exotic light demanding weeds occupying the site but look what happens when we get underneath the cover of this exotic willow. It's completely different. We don't have dominance by light demanding grass. In fact, we've got species like this Chitoki regenerating. We've got native pigeon wood down there, which does light shade. So let's have a closer look in here and see what's actually going on beneath this exotic willow. So the reason I've come back to this spot is some years ago I carried out an experiment here underneath the willow where I poisoned willow and set up a vegetation plot beneath the poisoned willow and also set up vegetation plots under intact willow to look at because I did notice that there was regeneration of native species occurring in the understory so I thought it would be really interesting to see how canopy opening would affect regeneration. So I've come back here some years later to have a look at what I'm in one of my poison sites and I'm here to look at what the effect has been. This is what this plot looked like in 2013, a few months after I had poisoned a willow tree. Note the short stature of the Mahawi in 2013, eight years ago. And these photos show the site in 2015. At this stage the data had indicated a pulse of regeneration, but this response was only seen in the lower seedling tiers. It was still early days for forest regeneration following the experimental treatment. 
Now, six years on, let's see how this area has regenerated. Okay, so I've come right down to the stump of the dead willow tree. So this is one that I drilled and put glyphosate into. And, you know, it's heavily decomposed. The limbs are all on the ground. Um, so it's completely opened up the space for other plants. And what we've got now, instead of willow in the canopy, we've got sort of three meter tall mahoe. We've got pigeon wood. We have um, caprosma. Um, there's a, this uh, totra sapling is well over my head, up to about two meters tall. Um, we also have some not so good things. It's actually really uncomfortable moving through here. We've got blackberry um, has been hanging on. This is a particularly nasty weed, which is shade tolerant. Um, Tutsin, so this is a problem. It's really um, hanging on in this site. Um, and we have some old man's beard as well. So really what this site needed, as well as canopy opening, would be um, some ongoing weed control. So the gap I made, because it was only one willow tree, it really didn't open up a big expanse and it was really just a localised canopy gap which favoured these natives which require some shelter and shade. You know, and it kept out those plant species that are such a problem outside, the exotic grass and those other really light demanding weeds. They just haven't been able to get in here. So it really is a transition from an exotic canopy to a native canopy. This is a really pleasing result. Um, like I said, it does require serious weed control. It's not something that you can just come and do, but you know, this um, manipulating this stand has avoided the need to intervene by planting all these natives. They've just been able to establish on their own. It's important to understand the context of what I've shown. This isn't going to occur everywhere. Um, there's some main factors which have allowed this to happen. Um, one is the rainfall. We're quite near the um, Ruahine Ranges here. Um, we're in the rain shadow and there is um, probably around 1500 millimetres per annum of rainfall. Also in the landscape there are tracts of um, old growth forest remnants. So there's native conifer stands, there's quite a lot of titoki on farms. People have been looking after this landscape. Um, there's also dispersers. The um, avian dispersers which spread the fruit of these trees are present. So they are able to, to distribute seed from the surrounding landscape and deposit it here. Um, so if any one of those factors wasn't adequate, this wouldn't be happening. And in fact you don't have to go far further to the east from this location where it gets very dry, down to 800 or 700 millimetres per annum of rainfall, and this simply won't happen. You know, within probably four or five kilometres from here, it'll just be too dry. The seed sources are, um, are just not there. So this is just something that's particular to this location, but it's, it's a pretty cool phenomenon. And here I am back out in the open, back out in all the blackberry and the tall exotic grass. Um, it's just a real mess out here. So it just goes to show even an exotic tree species in the right conditions can actually address all the competition from exotic species and create a favourable climate for native rainforest species to establish. It's not to say that it's a quick fix and like any forest it's going to require management. The site I've been in today has bad issues, it has bad weed issues in terms of um, the Tutsin and the old man's beard and even blackberries hanging on in the shade. So it's not a site that you can just do this and walk away and leave. It will require ongoing management, but that ongoing management is probably going to be a lot easier than planting to establish a forest. So this is, this is a pretty cool scenario. Managing these really weedy sites, um, you know, it's going to require a lot of input. It's going to cost a lot of money to establish native forest actively here. So if we can find ways to, you know, observe and use natural processes such as what the willow is doing here for forest regeneration, we can really upscale our restoration and we're not confined to trying to plant forests everywhere in these remote, um, pretty difficult sites. So. This is just one example of what we call passive restoration where instead of focusing on planting natives we focus on um, the processes around regeneration and management of those processes so that regeneration and succession occur.
Thanks very much for watching this video. I've really enjoyed putting it together. I hope you've learned something about forest regeneration and forest succession. It's actually been a real trip down memory lane to come back and look at this site so many years on. If you did like the video, please give it a thumbs up and let me know any comments in the comments below. I'll get back to you. Um, please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future episodes and share this with anyone who you think might be interested. For now, thanks for watching this video on forest regeneration and forest succession and I'll see you again next time.